Hi everyone. I read this book about 15 years ago, The Rise of Adventism, edited by Edwin Scott Gausted, one of the most famous modern Christian historians in the United States. And it's a series of essays on the build-up to the movement we now call Adventism. The subhead is a commentary on the social and religious ferment of mid-19th century America. It's published in 1974. So I, I read it with great interest, trying to get more, more of the deep background of where my movement, Jehovah's Witnesses, came from, which I knew enough to know it came from Adventism, but I didn't know very much about the religious ferment going on in America. This book supplied, therefore, a, a great need for me in understanding what gives, gives rise in the next generation after, after uh, Napoleon and the uh, socio-political ferment that was going on in the first third of the 19th century. What gave rise to this movement? It was in England and other parts of the English-speaking world, but it centered in America, and particularly in the, the northeast of America. Winthrop Hudson, another church historian who was very prominent in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, wrote the first chapter, and the first chapter is entitled A Time of Religious Ferment, and he starts with John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, who was going out of office in 1829. And his successor was Andrew Jackson. And some of them dreaded, some of the old guard of America dreaded the arrival of Jackson and what he represented. Here's how uh, Winthrop Hudson describes that uh, transition. At the White House, according to John Quincy Adams' memoirs, the year 1829 began in deep gloom. Quote, the president's wife spent a sleepless and painful night, and Mr. Adams, waking at daybreak, found the dawn overcast, the skies heavy and sullen. He prayed briefly, then fumbled for his Bible and turned to the book of Psalms, reading slowly by the yellow light of his shaded oil lamp. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. On he read to the ultimate assurance, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. End of quote. The familiar words were comforting. They affirm, he noted in his journal, that is, John Quincy Adams affirmed, that the righteous man is and shall be blessed. As he wrote, the lamp its oil low flared for a moment, then flickered out. Mr. Adams sat in the gray light. The occasion for Adams' despondency was the election of Andrew Jackson two months before, an election that was to usher in the era of the common man. Daniel Webster expressed his foreboding when he noted that the general would arrive in Washington about February 15th. Nobody knows what he will do when he comes. This is a direct quote from Webster. My opinion is, when he does come, he will bring a breeze with him. Which way it will blow, I cannot tell. My fear is stronger than my hope. It was otherwise with those who flocked to Washington for the inauguration. They came with hope. The sky was overcast, but the sun came out as the president-elect left for the Capitol to take his oath of office. It was a proud day for the people, Amos Kendall reported. General Jackson is their own president. The shouting crowd was symptomatic of the surge of eager expectation of change that welled up among those who felt aggrieved throughout the land. The old order was passing, a multiplying population, the admission of new states, the extension of voting to the property lists, the abolition of religious tests in several of the states had shifted the balance of power in the nation. And now, Old Hickory, the popular favorite, was in office as an earnest of a future filled with promise. The primary effect of the election was a shifting of personnel, the toppling of the old order by excluding from office the well-born and well-educated who had long been accustomed to holding the reins of power. In their stead were installed, so it seemed, to the displaced leaders who pandered to the self-interest of the baser sort of people and were guided by dictates of popular expediency. 
This was the nub of the matter. This was the source of the gloomy predictions of the defeated and of the eager expectations of the victors, expectations aroused by the assumption of power by representatives of common folk who felt that their interests had long been ignored, neglected, and betrayed. Whereas Justice Joseph's story folk spoke rather disconsolately of the triumph of King Mob, the new president's followers were animated by a more optimistic creed, a creed that was to be summarized again and again by Andrew Johnson, one of Jackson's most ardent adherents. Andrew Johnson, future president, said, I believe man can be elevated, man can become more and more endowed with divinity. And as he does, he becomes more godlike in his character and capable of governing himself. Let's go on elevating our people, perfecting our institutions, until democracy shall reach such a point of perfection that we can acclaim with truth that the voice of the people is the voice of God. End of quote. The creed was a curious blend of faith in the efficacy of democratic institutions and evangelical religion to perfect the individual and thus perfect society. Johnson goes on, the democratic party proper of the whole world, and especially the United States, has undertaken the political redemption of man, and sooner or later, the great work will be accomplished. In the political world, it corresponds to that of Christianity and the moral. They are going along, not in divergence or in parallels, but in converging lines, the one purifying and elevating man religiously, the other politically. At what period of time they will have finished the work of progress and elevation is not now for me to determine. But when finished, these two lines will have approximated each other, man being perfected both in a religious and a political point of view. As he continued, Johnson became lyrical in his vision of the future, noting that as the lines converge, then can, quote, proclamation be made that the millennial morning has dawned, and that the time has come when the lion and the lamb shall lie down together, when the voice of the turtle shall be heard in our land, when the glad tidings shall be proclaimed of man's political and religious redemption, and that there is on earth peace, goodwill toward men. End of quote. It was a heady, intoxicating gospel, and Jackson's election marked the beginning of a heady, intoxicating time. Not for all, but for many. Small wonder that Alice Felt Tyler adopted Freeman's ferment, Freedom's Ferment as the descriptive title of her social history of the period. As Andrew Johnson indicated, political and religious ideas and movements were intermingled during these years of ferment. General historians have referred to the period as the era of the common man, while church historians have frequently described it as a time when Methodism triumphed in America. The term Methodist was used not as the name of a denomination, but as a shorthand for a type of popular religious enthusiasm which burst through lines of denominational division and penetrated Protestant church life in general in upstate New York and backcountry New England as well as in Kentucky and Tennessee, in Virginia and the Carolinas as well as in Indiana and Illinois. Presbyterian, Baptist and Congregational churches succumbed to theological emphases, religious fervor and revivalist techniques which in the public mind were most commonly associated with the Methodists. Not even German Reformed and German Lutheran churches in Pennsylvania, as J.W. Nevin noted with dismay in his tracts for the Times, The Anxious Bench, that was 1843, not even those churches were immune to the contagious influence of enthusiastic religion. Indeed, it was not a Methodist, but a Presbyterian, Charles G. Finney, who became the most prominent and influential representative of this religion of the common people. I'll put in a link to Richard Hofstetter, who uh, wrote the famous book Anti-Intellectual in Anti-Intellectualism in Modern in American Life, and also traces to this period Jackson's election, the, the start of that thing that we now identify as American religion. The character of it was formed at this time, and it's characterized by enthusiasm, optimism, egalitarianism, 
this quest for equality in society you could equate with the democratic spirit but also anti-intellectualism next time more about the the, the birth of modern evangelism charles g finney <laughs>